When swords were outlawed in the Meiji era, the mighty samurais began to disappear. Those who rejected the ban rebelled, causing unrest throughout the countryside. To combat this criminal activity, an inescapable lake prison was constructed. Three young men, born of the Kumo line, were given the duty of delivering <clears throat> were given the duty of delivering criminals to their place of confinement. But could there be more to their mission? Wait, are you just reading the Crunchyroll synopsis for the thing we're talking about today? Well, sort of. What do you mean, sort of? Isn't that kind of a yes or no situation? See, I was reading the blurb for Laughing Under the Clouds. Today, though, we're talking about Laughing Under the Clouds Gaiden, the side story slash sequel to the original 12 episode anime. So you mean there's more than just this single anime? And that's to say nothing of the live action movie from 2018, the original manga from 2013 to 2017, nor the prequel manga Laughing in Limbo, which is still running today. Um, that's a lot going on there. That's right, Laughing Under the Clouds, or as it's originally known, Donten ni Warao, is the alternate history, supernatural action adventure series first put to paper in 2011 by Karakara Kemuri. Since that beginning in monthly comic Avarice, Laughing Under the Clouds has ballooned into a bona fide franchise of massive proportions. Since 2014, the series has gained new popularity when Don Ten jumped from the printed page and onto the television screen with a 12 episode series. Following the original manga's plot, the series deals with the trio of brothers from the family name Kumo, as they explore the mysteries of a dubious floating prison. Several years later, this anime series was followed up by a trilogy of hour long OVAs, which serve as a sequel to the original run. This miniseries was recently released in America by Shout Factory and Eleven Arts, who provided us a copy, leading us to tumble down this surprisingly deep rabbit hole. As we went in without any prior information, we'll be taking a look specifically at Laughing Under the Clouds Gaiden, or Donten as is the given American name for the series. Does this release hold up as a good jumping off point for newcomers, or is prior information necessary to fully appreciate these OVAs? We'll also be exploring what the Don't Ten franchise at large can tell us about the time period and culture in which it takes place. Don't Ten's Gaiden series loses no time jumping straight into the action of the three films. We join up with the previously mentioned Kumo brothers one year after their fateful battle with the ancient mythical dragon Orochi. Those interested in the Japanese origin myth, and those who have played Okami, will remember Orochi to have been one of the great evils of Japanese mythology. That's the end of the story as far as Japanese mythology is concerned. Sort of. But in the Donten universe, Orochi has developed this nasty habit of reincarnating every 300 years. He doesn't just do this by materializing again as an eight-headed serpent outright, however. Instead, Orochi is only able to enter and control the body of a human born with the predetermined ability to be a vessel for the Mad Dragon. At this point, we'll go ahead and say that if you haven't seen either Laughing Under the Clouds or the OVA which we're discussing today, you might do well to skip to the time on screen. The time between now and then will be filled with spoilers, as we can't exactly talk about the sequel to the original show without spoiling the show itself. If you're a fan of period anime, action anime, supernatural stories, or you just want to pinch those boys' cheeks, be sure to check out both of these series. If you've already seen the show and the OVAs on the other hand, let's dive into it. The potential of a vessel appearing for Orochi means that only certain individuals have the symptoms necessary to contain Orochi, which, as it turns out, is the reason behind the isolated prison on Lake Biwa, mentioned before. In effect, this is a location built specifically to house all of Orochi's potential victims for his most recent reincarnation, this time in the 1870s. In addition to the prison, the original series takes a look at the Yamainu, literally mountain hounds, a group of experts assembled specifically to kill Orochi once he presents himself. This squad stands opposed to the Kumo brothers, young men who are otherwise humble stewards of their family shrine. Over time, it becomes apparent that the Kumo brothers may have more to do with Orochi's legacy than anyone may have expected. Donten Gaiden follows the events of the series, the emergence of and battle with Orochi by the Yama Inu. When we began the first film, The Oath of the Yama Inu, we're rejoined by the Kumos and the Yama Inu one year after this monumental battle. 
The eldest brother is dealing with his crippling injuries incurred during the battle, while the Yama Inu struggle with their sense of purpose with their express mission now completed. Without any prior context, this film was admittedly a bit difficult to follow. Not to say that it was confusing from a narrative standpoint, half of the film took place in flashback, offering contextual background for the modern events. On the other hand, we consistently got the sense that we were missing a sort of foundational context. In other words, we were understanding what was happening, and we could understand everyone's relationships with one another. But we couldn't shake the feeling that there was a deeper understanding to be gleaned from delving deeper into the original series. This sense continued with the second and third films. The second follows the story of two twin brothers growing up in a hidden ninja clan. One of the brothers has been locked away by his parents for most of his life, due to a fear that the higher-ups will kill him. Meanwhile, the other twin is allowed to be free and grow up in the clan, slowly moving toward the day when he'll be tested by the head of the group, a test which involves killing another member of the clan. This film, as it turns out, is a prequel to the original anime series, following the twins prior to their involvement with the Yama Inu. Thanks to this, until the end, the second film is the best standalone project of the three Gaiden films, given that it doesn't rely heavily on the source material. Instead, it presents a dramatic and emotional portrait of a family living in a system which they stand opposed to ideologically, yet which they must fall in line with to survive. The final Gaiden film, Conspiracy of the Military, is another sequel to the original Laughing Under the Clouds series, meaning it presents many of the same issues for new viewers as the Oath of the Yama Inu. Its approach, meanwhile, is quite different. Where the first film acted as something of an epilogue to the anime, Conspiracy of the Military is more of a sequel. This time around, the former Yama Inu must contend with a potential re-emergence of Orochi, not long after the beast has been slain for this 300-year cycle. Rather than being a legitimate reincarnation, however, this time the Yama Inu are tasked by the army with dispatching the last survivor of a secret program to infuse individuals with Orochi cells. In other words, the wild dogs are made to clean up after the misdeeds of their former leaders, physically, emotionally, and morally. After finishing the Donten Gaiden series, we ran into a bit of an issue, something which we've already touched on here. These films are well made, their art is pretty, their music is catchy, their character designs are awesome, but we kept asking ourselves what in the world was going on. As a result, we felt that we had to get to the bottom of what Laughing Under the Clouds was all about. We're frankly too lazy to do all that reading, so we returned to the first offshoot from the source, the 2014 anime. Hoping to get some answers, we dove into the 12 episode run of the original series almost immediately after finishing the sequel series. Yep, everything makes sense now. Who these people are, what their motivations and goals were, what they were referring to when talking about past events, why the entire second OVA was a giant flashback providing additional story for one of the main series' more mysterious characters pretty much all of it. Honestly, after coming out on the other side of Laughing Under the Clouds, we were struck with something of an irony. The original show didn't really sink its hooks into us for the first handful of episodes. Once it got going, the going got good, but without having watched the OVAs, we likely would have never picked this one up nor gotten past the third episode. On the other hand, none of the plot twists present in the show took us by surprise. Having already seen the aftermath of the series, not to mention the backstory of the show's secret villain. We were engrossed in the events, yet couldn't help wondering if we would be more invested without the foreknowledge. In this manner, we find ourselves in an awkward position, where we would likely recommend both the show and the OVA to more or less anyone with a passing interest. The show has a rocky start for sure, but over time it picks up and becomes genuinely intriguing. The OVAs, meanwhile, made us care about these characters in the first place enough to make us investigate further. That being said, if you've seen one without the other, we think you owe it to yourself to complete the cycle. Both projects are, naturally, reliant on one another for context and both thematic and character expansion. That being said, now that we've explored both fully, we feel like you shouldn't see one without the other. On that note, let us know in the comments if you were exposed to the show before the OVAs what your take on the latter release was. We're curious, given that we accidentally approached this all backwards. Beyond discussing the intricacies of the series and its sequel, prequel, side story spin-off, we were struck throughout their collective runtime by how several subjects came up multiple times. 
These subjects would likely be second nature or general knowledge for the original Japanese audience, but they may cause a tad bit of confusion for those of us here in the States. For that reason, we'd like to take the remainder of the video to discuss some of the cultural and historical aspects of Donten ni Warao, which may help to enrich your viewing experience. If you're just now joining us again after skipping the spoilers section of the video, welcome back. We hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Donten explores the battle between the samurai era, which reigned for centuries prior to the Meiji Restoration, and the modernization brought on by the ascension to the throne of Emperor Meiji in 1867. For example, even in the abstract for the entire franchise, we're hearing in brief about rebellions propagated by disenfranchised samurai who struggled against the institution of a standing army in the late 1860s and early 1870s. These aristocratic warriors grew up and trained in a world which promised them, based on nearly 700 years of precedent, a stable life and employment in Japan's samurai military. With the acquiescence of their national superiors and the resumption of power by the imperial family, these noblemen's livelihoods and features were wiped out in an instant. What's more, a proper parliamentary body was not established until 1889, with the ratification of the Meiji Constitution, meaning that Japan went through nearly 20 years of political upheaval and uncertainty in which the former samurai continued to struggle in order to gain some form of control. These rebellions lasted from the start of the Meiji regime until 1877, when between January and September, the samurai of the former Satsuma domain pitched a protracted miniature war against the newly formed Imperial Japanese Army. It's not unreasonable, then, to expect that rebellions like those discussed in Don Ten did actually happen. This offers the pretext to create a centralized prison on Lake Biwa to house all the rebels, from which point we enter the realm of the fantastical courtesy Orochi. The clash of cultures between Edo period Japan and the Meiji Restoration is presented most directly in the difference between the wardrobes of the government officials and the civilians within the world of Donten. You'll notice that for the most part, the military officials and members of the government have, by this point, adopted what may be considered a more Western mode of dress. Business suits, military service uniforms, and fancy flowing dresses are the standard with this aesthetic continuing into the hairstyles of these men and women. On the other hand, the people who populate the areas around Kyoto and the Kumo Shrine are clothed in kimono, as one may expect of the era. The difference presented here expresses the dissonance between the new and old, both alive in Japan during the bulk of the Meiji period. While the citizenry of Japan grappled with the realities of their newly opened borders, in truth, they were more insulated than those ranking high above them. Naturally, the military and the government of Meiji Japan dealt more directly with foreign officials. They wished in some capacity to portray Japan as being on the level with Western powers of the era, thus adopting all these newfangled clothes and hairstyles. For this reason, within Japan there existed a contingent who adhered more to cultural norms, represented by not just the citizens, but also the disenfranchised samurai and the ninja of the films as well as a group, the army and government, who sought to be considered more quote-unquote modern. Donten also explores the Japanese phenomenon of onnyoro. This is shown specifically through one of the Yama Inu members who is a practitioner of onnyoro. The ancient art of onnyoro, which means the way of yin and yang, is a mystical art developed roughly 1400 years ago within Japan. During the Heian period in the following centuries, Onmyoto enjoyed a large share of influence within the Japanese court before falling largely into obscurity. The tradition was certainly not lost, however, with many texts still existing today and scholars of magic even now paying a good deal of attention to Onmyoto. Abe no Seime, the father of Onmyoto, was tasked by the emperor's court with explaining anomalous occurrences within Japan exercising malicious spirits, keeping Kyoto safe from harm, and conducting geomancy. Geomancy is the study of patterns observed within earthen objects which are cast upon the ground. This type of divination is not exclusive to Japan, of course, with geomancy having been studied all over the world in ages past. Along the same lines, other Onmyoto methodologies are shared with Western magic. This crossover included the drawing of pictograms, compare the gobose with the pentagram, the use of ofuda, 
that is, papers infused with spells or wards, and the summoning of Shikigami, spirits who act as servants of the summoner. All of these elements appear within Donten at one point or another, meaning the series and films are a great jumping off point for learning more about the art of Onmyodo. Another aspect of Donten which is immediately prevalent is the inclusion of the ancient serpent Orochi, short for Yamata no Orochi. Orochi was first described in two of the first pieces of Japanese history, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, aka the Nihongi. As the legend goes, Orochi was a lover of fine dining and whining, by which we mean he had a taste for fair maidens and sake. This got him into a bit of trouble with Susanoo, brother of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. Susanoo took pity on a family who had lost multiple daughters to Orochi's appetite, and tricked the beast into getting so drunk on sake that Orochi passed out. At this point, Susanoo slew the serpent and offered the sword to his sister. This sword, known as Kusanagi, quickly became one of the imperial regalia of Japan, thus tying the imperial family directly to the country's origin myths and to the sun goddess. Orochi has long been a popular character, thanks to his being Japanese mythology's original pure evil villain, more or less. He's also become a popular big bad in more recent Japanese media, from Okami to the King of Fighters series, with this eight-headed serpent taking on a number of different styles and interpretations. In Donten, Orochi adheres closely to what you would expect of the big old boy, though in this case the creators took a popular route for expansion on the Orochi myth. As we mentioned earlier, in the world of Donten, Orochi is reborn every three centuries to a new host. This is one of the easiest shortcuts to get such a powerful villain into your fictional world, as well as a direct link between a story and Japan's cultural heritage. Naturally, Donten takes full advantage of the shortcut to great effect. His character might not be explored very thoroughly, but Donten certainly provides another notable example of Orochi in modern Japanese media. There are other allusions to Japanese mythology throughout the series too, but with the episode already going this long we figured it best to move on. Tell us in the comments if you want to hear more about this. One last point upon which we would like to touch before leaving you is the phenomenon of the ninja. Given that Donten features several ninja among its main cast, as well as an entire clan, based off a real world counterpart, within the extended cast, we thought this a golden opportunity to explore one of the most fascinating discoveries we've made since beginning this channel. As it turns out, much like the legend of the American cowboy compared with his real life counterpart, much of what is known and assumed about the Japanese ninja is false. In fact, as some of you likely know, the term ninja is something of an anachronism, which has come to be favored largely by Westerners in this past century. In reality, there were a number of different names for those we would call ninja, Rapa, Monomi, Nokizaru, and so on. The most common term, however, was Shinobi. Shinobi and ninja actually share the same kanji, with shinobi being the Japanese reading of the two characters, and ninja being the Chinese reading. As it turns out, shinobi weren't the all-black wearing, running on the rooftops, disappearing into a cloud of smoke, magical jutsu hand-flinging ninja that we're aware of in America. Instead, these mysterious individuals, who first emerged during the several shogun periods of Japanese history, were largely what we would call mercenaries and spies. They were made to appear as nondescript citizens, who might be able to infiltrate the citadels of rival clans. At this point, shinobi would either report information back to their bosses, or else perform assassinations for their leaders. The reality behind shinobi may be more mundane than expected by those familiar with the modern myth of the ninja, but their history, which was recorded at least, is fascinating regardless. Donten, as is natural for a contemporary anime, doesn't exactly deal with shinobi in a realistic manner. Instead, the franchise takes the more common, fantasticized approach. This isn't a knock, of course, as the character writing within Donten is strong to the point that everyone is enjoyable here, ninja or not. As with Onmyodo, however, we found this to be a good point from which to explore the reality behind the shinobi, something we ought to cover again with another film at some point. That about covers it for Donten ni Warao, Laughing Under the Clouds, and its Gaiden OVAs. These films and the original series may not be the greatest thing to ever hit the small or the silver screen, but there's more than enough to enjoy and explore within this small franchise. If you're a fan of the Meiji period and its aesthetics, 
Japanese history, Japanese mythology and its modern reinterpretations, or simply solid character dramas, this collection might have what you're looking for in it. Let us know in the comments below what you think of Donten, and which other series or movies viewers of Donten might enjoy. If you check this one out, we hope you enjoy it. And if you've already seen Donten, we hope you've learned something new today.